Hey folks, welcome back to another video and thank you for tuning back in. This video is on um, installing a two axis DRO on my Jet 16 mil. It's kind of a general uh, introduction to installing DROs and I think you'll get something out of it if you uh, are gonna be doing this on virtually any machine tool. This, uh, I'm shooting this intro after the fact though, um, after I've got it all installed and I'm in editing right now because I'm realizing some things I forgot. One of the things that happened was toward the end uh, of installing the, the Y-axis, which is the one I show you the most detail on. It was the hardest one, so I thought that would be appropriate. I kind of had to shut this off and move on. I was on a time crunch. So after that, I just give you a summary of what I did after it was all completed. But you definitely see enough that you're gonna be able to understand um, how to, how well, it is difficult, but how crafty you gotta be as far as making bracket, brackets and things like that to get this to work, because it is a universal, uh, uh, application. All right, so that, that's one thing. The other thing is when I was working on that Y-axis DRO, I kept turning the backing plate upside down by accident as I was lining it up, and you'll see that, and I flag it in text and then flag it in actual clip uh, once I realize it. And then we corrected that, no problem. Uh, it actually helped us out a little bit at one point, and you'll see that too. But we corrected it, and we've got the Y-axis and the X-axis fully functional, Everything works nice and smooth, and I think you're gonna, again, be able to get something out of this. So with that, let's go ahead and get right to it. We're gonna go over and take a look at the stuff first. Now by stuff, I mean, of course, the boxes, which just came via UPS. So let's go ahead and open this one up first. Oh, okay. For some reason, they decided to ship the brackets. This is a little bracket kit that comes with these, with these setups. And you gotta understand, this is a universal setup. I should have prefaced the uh, intro even with that. Uh, this universal setup is made for pretty much anything. As long as the linear scales are the correct length. Gee, I hope they are. Um, then you're, you're pretty much up to you. It's up to you what, how you put it on, as far as whether you use the hardware or you make your own stuff, which is what I did on the lathe, which is why it took me almost three days to put it on. But that's just a little um, bracket package, probably a bunch of screws like M4s and stuff in there. And this is for the display. This is your DRO readout arm. That's what it is, it's an arm. That's what that is, DRO readout arm. Get that out of the way. In this box, therefore, shall be, or should be, the uh, display. I always get worried about this. I don't know how close to the surface this crap is, but there should be plenty of, yeah. It is the display. I'm almost positive that's the exact same display as the one that's on the lathe. It's their universal one, as I said, just a universal readout display for a DRO. It's three axis capable, like the one on the lathe. Naturally, we're only gonna be using X and Y on this one, and the other one we use X and Z. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure what that is. I don't remember that coming in the other one either. Some sort of a bracket for something. I guess for this? I don't remember that coming in the other one. I'm not sure what that's for. Something like, I don't know, we'll look it up. It's gotta have something to do with that. So there's your display. Ta-da. Power cord, must have power. Um, some more screws, or maybe these are these screws, I don't know. These are M4s of different lengths. A couple of washers and some instructions, which are pretty much useless. But yeah, this is the same display, so. I'm such an expert on the other one, not that uh, shouldn't be a problem for me. I have no idea what this is, I really don't. Something, I don't, I don't know. This did not come with the other one. Let's see if it fits on, this doesn't make any, I don't know what this is. You got me on this one. It, it can't fit on the back here because the, they're like uh, VGA plugs, you know, for a computer. That won't fit there unless it, I, I don't know what it is. We're not gonna use it because the arm, now that I've got the nomenclature correctly, bolts right up or screws right up to these holes here. Screw it up. All right, we'll take this out so we don't damage it. Oh, I forgot too that um, these come with a condom for the front of it. I have the condom on the lathe one. It's just a slip-on condom, extra large. Linear scales, this is the business end. Now on this particular mill, I calculated out that I would need about, just about 20 inches. <laughs> don't we all need 20 inches? On the x-axis, and this, the y-axis is only about six inches. When you, when you measure from its full travel, the x on this machine is just not very deep. I'm sorry, the y is not very deep. Why? Because it isn't. 
So the Y is just in, the in and out, of course, and X is left and right. Just not very deep, so therefore it doesn't need to be that long. Let's go ahead and open that one up first. More hardware, which is nice. There's a cover in here, which we'll get to in a minute. So there's your linear um, scale. I should say, well, it's a linear scale. I'm sure it's a glass scale. It's not the best one, but uh, it is what it is. There's this red plastic piece that bridges between the encoder and the scale itself when you first take it out of the packet. But it's held down with screws on the back side and on the top side. And that's for shipping of the encoder and scale, and also it's your spacer. So you leave it in, you can take the screws out, but if you leave it in, or at least put it back in, you can space out the distance between the encoder and the scale with this device right here. So essentially it's like a feeler gauge. Anyway, the way, the way they explained it in the other manual, they said that when the label was up in its upright position, when the scale, I think, goes in, it reduces the number, negative number on the display, which correlates with taking off material, something like that. I think you can swap it in the, uh, this, yeah, you can, because I already did it once on the lathe on the Z axis. The Z was set up, even though I put it upright, the label, it was set up on the positive when I, when I went in toward the chuck. So I wanted it to go negative, because again, you're taking material off. We'll just, we can switch it back and forth doesn't really matter in this case, all right? It really doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Here's a fancy dancy cover for it. They're actually pretty nice. They're pretty heavy duty. Heavy duty, man. And uh, they work real nice. You take off, well, it's a backing plate for the, for the uh, linear scale and the cover. So you take these screws out. There's your backing plate that the, that the linear scale goes on to. And then you can just screw this on afterwards after you get all this done. You see you got your oblong holes here, or oval holes. You, Move your Ovaltine around. So yeah, that's that. So I'm not gonna, well, I'm gonna pull the other one out because I wanna show you how these lay in. I was gonna say I don't need to open the other one up, but I do. We need to make sure they're gonna work. Pretty sure the short one's good. And I'm pretty sure the long one is too, but you never know until you lay your long one right up against where it's gonna get shoved into to know that um, it's gonna be proper. Okay, there's our cover, again, with the backing plate on it, and then our longer linear scale. I'm gonna switch you around. We're gonna go over to the mill now and I'm gonna show you how this lays out. We're gonna make sure that these are all gonna fit and I'll give you my idea on my plan. Oh yeah. Oh, she got some weight to her. I've said that before. Let's go ahead and put some light on the subject. I mentioned in the last video a few things that I was going to do or I did on the mill here and those are all completed. And the one thing I wanted to do was get all the ways and stuff cleaned up by taking the whole thing apart, which I did. I did film some clips of it. I was actually gonna do a video on it, but this thing is really, really simple to take apart. If you got a mill like this, whether it's a Jet brand or a XYZ brand or whatever the heck it is, and it looks like this, it's really easy to take apart. And really, I'll show you really quick what you gotta do if you're gonna take this thing apart. Like if you're gonna take your table off, take uh, slide everything apart and clean your ways and stuff, you basically pull your handles off and undo these blocks. After you drive this pin out, there's a pin on each side that kind of sets the preload because inside here there are on each end, there's a, there's a thrust ball bearing. And the way they've calculated this out when they built it is that's what sets your preload. So it kind of squeezes it in together. So that way the play is minimum. So you drive that pin out, you take these blocks out, same thing on the other side. Then you can unwind the uh, lead screw right out of it and then just pick this right up off of it. It's as simple as that. Well, when you got to slide it out, I should say. You slide it out to one side because it's got dovetails and pick it right off. The, the uh, saddle that goes in and out, your Y-axis, is a little more tricky. You'll see the lead screw uh, nut, if you will, the, the big boss that's got the, leads, the nut for the lead screw. I'm not sure what I, I call it like a pillow, pillow block. You got that pillow block in there that's got the thread for the lead screw. That's obviously sticking up because it goes through for the x-axis, left and right. Underneath that on the bottom side is the one for this. So what you have to do is you have to take the, there's a pin that, that kind of aligns it, just one pin, and then you kind of rotate it. Once you get the screw through and tighten the bolts down, it kind of rocks on that pin, and that gives you the, uh, the, the feel, basically, to make sure it's not binding up on the screw. But the thing is, all you gotta do is take those bolts out, drive the pin through, and then you just do a classic reach around from the back here, once this is all forward, and uh, do the same thing. You drive this pin out, you take the blocks, 
Oh, take the block off, comes right off. You can slide this thing way up. It'll only go so far until that block hits the, the casting, the main casting here of the base. And again, you can reach through from the back here, take it right out, secure the pin, and then when you go to put this thing back together, just slide the saddle back in, and you can do the same thing. You do a reach around and hold it up in there, put the bolts in, snug them, and then you can drive the pin through, and then you can put your lead screw in, and then you do the rest of it, just as I said. It is really easy to do. You can't really screw this up. So that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about that. Okay, I plan on putting the x-axis um, linear scale on the front here. I'm on a new Facebook group, called, new to me at least, called Round Column Mill Group. There's a couple of guys in there that done some very creative things with these, um, these jet, basically these round column mills. I'm not gonna necessarily call it a jet, but very similar is Jet 16. Because you know, like today with Grizzly and other manufacturers, they're made in this, probably in the same factory in China and they just badge them differently, kind of like lawn mowers. They almost look identical, there's very subtle differences. So I'm just gonna, I just took the table locks out to get a little clearance here as far as that goes. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I wanna put mine on the front here. Now I've got an oiler on the front, but I also got them on the back. So it really doesn't make any difference whether I put it on the front or the back as far as oiling goes. And I can get oil into it uh, pretty, pretty easily anyway. But my idea was I want to put it across the front because I want all the distance I can get going back toward the column. If you, if you put something behind here, it's going to interfere with the column. Now normally I have the vise which extends out past this and it doesn't go that far anyway. Without a vise on it's got a high potential or a lot of distance, potential distance to go. So if I am working with a workpiece uh, flat on the uh, deck here, um, without the vise, I want that uh, travel. And obviously I don't have any restrictions to length, said the wife, out here. So we can just pull it out as far as we want and it comes out so far and it's not gonna get with, a, with the handle or anything. Now these slots on the front are for little T-nuts where the stops were and this center part was where that main stop, stop block was mounted, which we're not gonna need anymore. And, but we will need these, which are the, um, again, the table locks. So let me go get the linear scale and I'll show you what I, my, my idea was. Remember, you have the scale and the encoder, the reader on the scale. One has to move while the other one stays stationary. All right, <laughs> you just gotta understand that part. I'm sure you do already. If I take this and I put it here, and I can see that we're actually a little bit long. Hang on, we're forgetting a piece. Remember, the cover, uh, the backing plate here um, is what that scale mounts to. So what we can do is we can just utilize, of course, these two holes here which are well inboard of the ends and it'll be just fine. In fact, we may be able to use these T, T uh, slots here. Uh, I don't know if I'll do that or not. Get the idea. Let me take these out and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so your, um, your mounting plate's got a lip on the bottom of it or top, I guess, if you wanted to put it that way. Ours is gonna go like this. And uh, maybe we can, I doubt we're gonna be able to clear that uh, oiler. So I'm not really sure what we're gonna do about that because we may end up having to pry this oiler out actually or tap it in even further. I don't know what's gonna work, how that's gonna work with that uh, because even we could always mill a relief into that so we can use it again. But the trouble is uh, the encoder is gonna be sitting down to that, or I should say the scale is gonna be sitting down to that level. So unfortunately it's just not gonna work for us. It's, all it's gonna do is get in the way and not let this thing sit flush. But anyway, it's going to be like this. If it overhangs the sides a little bit, that's fine. What happens is the scale gets screwed in at this end, this end, the backing plate gets screwed in here or wherever you wanted it to if you decided to mill some reliefs in here because they're little cap bolts, of course. And then, uh, then you just uh, kind of level it up and do your thing. And yeah, so that's basically what we're going to be doing. And I'm not 100% sure if we're going to use those. Um, we may end up using these. I'll just make new ones because um, that's probably M6. But if it wasn't, I don't know, maybe I'll just make new ones. Or we can take, yeah, we can take the ones that we have. I think I have the other one, there's two of them. That's the plan on the uh, X axis. The uh, Y axis has to go hither on this side. And the reason is because there's a lock for the X axis on the right side. And that's gonna be right in the way. And you, the gib is over on the right side there, so that's where the lock is. The lock pretty much always goes into the gib. 
just like in the front here, the gib is in the front. So it pushes up against the gib to lock the table for the x-axis. Likewise for the y-axis over there. So we gotta stay away from that side because of that. I'm just gonna get this table over to the right here a little bit to kind of give you a better shot. All right, so let me get you lower too because you're gonna be able to need to see this. Okay, it is the next day and I've been studying on what I'm gonna do with this y-axis from yesterday's clips. Kinda tried a few things. I shot off cam, did off camera rather, and I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna think about this. So I think I'll come up with a viable option. Um, I'll explain that here in a second. Uh, the options you have in this case, of course, because you have to span this dis distance here, this spot here is your saddle, this is your base. This moves, this is stationary. So if we're gonna put the scale, for example, on the moving part, it would, it would have to be here or stuck way up in here or something like that, and then we have to attach the uh, encoder down there. Well, the problem with this, of course, is this is uh, unmachined casting here, unmachined casting here, unmachined casting here, although this is relatively flat here, and this is relatively flat here. My initial thought was to take some straight pieces of aluminum, go straight down from here to here, and uh, put it right there. It can be adjusted this way, it can be shimmed this way, and uh, pretty much life is good but I really didn't like the look of that. And I said, you know, it'd be nicer, nice if I could take advantage of machine surfaces. And shoving it in here and putting like a block of aluminum to bring that out, this is so irregular in here, I think it would be very difficult to do. So I went down to the store and I picked up some inch and a quarter, I want an inch and a half, but inch and a quarter by one eighth angle. I just cut off two, three inch sections in the bandsaw. And my idea is to do this come in from, this will be my reference surface, this is a machine surface on the front of the uh, saddle here. And we come here and be below this surface of the table and bring this down to about yay there. This will hang down here. That way we can get this to there. And we'll have to drill new holes in this because it doesn't reach for, far enough over to here, but that's, I think that's gonna be fine. I don't really see any other way to do this anyway. So I have to put different holes in this and I can do that in the mill. We can just take it and duplicate these. Like I said, if I had inch and a half, it may have just worked. Maybe I should have gotten the two inch stuff, but they didn't have inch and a half, but they did have two inch. So I'm thinking about doing something like this. I think it'd be worth redrawing the holes for that on this piece, re-slotting them. Uh, because, uh, you know, again, we can, we can take advantage of that machine surface, this front surface here. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll remove, see the section here where it cuts away, we'll just remove that. Okay, we really don't need that. We'll leave a little bit of an edge here to give it some rigidity, but, you know, we'll cut that away to look better. And, you know, it'll be something like that maybe, you know. I don't know exactly how much I'm going to cut out or what have you yet. Because it has to be down low enough where it's going to, uh, hold all of this here. So I think that's what I'm going to end up doing. I wish there was another way I could do it, but uh, I think that's the best way to do it. And again, we're going to have to modify this thing by putting some different holes in it. That's just the way it is, but I can just measure these up and, and redo them. I'll just duplicate them a certain distance away from each um, side um, of the hole itself that we have already. So right here, we'll put one like over here and then put the other one over here. Something like that. that that's the, what I have in mind, at least, to do this thing. I think that's going to be the best way to do it. It's going to be the easiest way in the long run. It'll take some machining up front, but as far as lining it up and getting it all trammed in, that's going to really be a lot easier when I'm up against a machine reference surface. Because if I was going up against, we're going to space it away just a little bit. And what I'll do is on these guys, we'll figure out where we're going to put two holes and we'll slot those. That way we can manipulate it this way, just slight slotting them, slotting them slightly. And that way when we drill in there, we can, we can get this this way. And essentially, we're not going to have to worry about it this way because it's going to be against that machine surface. So like I said, it's going to take a little bit of machining up in front, but um, I think it's going to be better in the long run. So that's, that's what we're going to do. So I guess um, what I'm going to do now is... I'm gonna put the four inch vise on here and just give it a quick tram in. It doesn't have to be perfect. And that way we can use the four inch vise and do a little bit, a couple machining thing. We'll clean back up 
And uh, once we got that done, I'm gonna come back when we got all these drilled, cleaned up, deburred. Uh, I may even kind of clean up the edges and with an end mill, I'm not sure yet. And then we'll have these done too, where we're gonna put uh, some new holes and some new slots in, you know, some counter, these are really just counter bores, you know, for the screw heads, cap bolts. So need to duplicate that and I think it'll be fine. All right, so all our machining for now is done at least. So I've got these um, counterboard and slotted, the new ones on the ends. I made these brackets up, did a couple of operations on these, uh, including uh, squaring up the sides and then cutting this relief in here. And that relief, see if I got the right one here, um, that relief goes like this. So you can see what I'm talking about in regards to having it um, open down there because our our backing plate's gonna go up against that. So it really doesn't need anything down in there. And anything that was uh, stretching across this point was gonna interfere with the, uh, with the base anyway. So we just got that out of the way. So really all we gotta do is, well, let me finish this. Um, I'm not too happy with the slotted holes in it. I need the proper size end mills for this. I probably should have drilled it at five instead of five and a half mil and then use that 1 8 because I was just trying to match the hole size. It's going to work. I only slotted one for obvious reasons, so it can be moved just a little bit. It would have been able to move a little bit anyway, though, with 5.5 uh, millimeter holes and 5 mil fasteners. But this way, at least it gives me a little bit of room this way. So as long as I space it out just a little bit, I'll have up and up and down. We'll put something behind there, like a feeler gauge or something, to make sure we got enough space. And then we're gonna drill into this face here. I haven't picked the shape of the, uh, the uh, height of the holes rather. Shape of the holes is round. <laughs> haven't picked the, the height of it. We're gonna run off the ways here on the base, come up and over. That way they're both the same on the front of the back. Uh, but you know, this is variable because what's gonna really um, tie this in is when we put the encoder down on the bottom here of the saddle, that comes later. So right now what we have to do is we have to get it to the point where we have these brackets installed, uh, both pretty much the same uh, as far as their location from the ways here. And then, um, and, and of course we have to make sure we have a little bit of adjustability then. Then what we can do is we can kind of hold this up, clamp it in place perhaps, and then um, figure out where those holes are gonna be and we'll drill and tap those. Uh, it's only one eighth of an inch material, but if it's a fine thread, an M4, uh, the M5, rather, is a .08 um, millimeter thread pitch, so it's pretty pretty fine thread. It'll be fine for this. And then uh, we'll uh, just go on the back side. <laughs> I love it in the back side. And then what we'll do is we'll just make sure that we've got it, uh, you know, done that way. So it'll go through. We could always put a nut on the back if necessary, but I think it'll be fine. So that's what we're gonna do next. Um, but you know, these came out okay. You know, I mill, like I said, I milled the, uh, I milled them square so I'd have a reference surface. So when we put them in like this, we could get this milled out um, and make it as nice as possible. I think they'll work just fine. Of course, this one you gotta remember if you're doing something like this, 
The one on the other side's got to be um, a mirror image. So once you get this this side done, you got to do the other side opposite. I taped a small washer or flat washer on the back of this to give me some spacing and that worked out pretty well. We'll set that aside for the next one. And so we got that done there. And uh, these are, this is the M5 hardware that comes with it. By the way, the drill I was using is a number 19 drill, which is uh, 166 thou. Uh, 4.2 mil is a tap drill for an M5, which is converted over to 166, uh, 165. So that's close enough. These don't come with the, with the kit, but I'm putting block washers and flats on them. They, the flats come with them, but they're kind of crappy. So putting some stainless on. All right, so there's your, I haven't even tightened that yet. There's your front one. And again, now that I've gotten sawdust all over everything, so to speak, there's the uh, base for the the y-axis, the bottom, and that's gonna go like that. And uh, remember, I spaced these holes out, so this thing's gonna be spread about equally. And then all we have to do is mount the encoder in the location that you need to mount it to make sure that it's got the appropriate amount of, uh, uh, of space between the end of its uh, movement and uh, encoder itself, which is, I think, 10 mil. They say it's gotta be 10 mil away. In other words, when you slide that encoder in at bottoms, it's got to be at least 10 mil back. That's going to be well within the tolerance of this. So I think it's going to be pretty good. So I'm really liking that a lot. Um, that's going to give us um, a good amount of adjustability this way. It's going to give us adjustability this way. We're referencing a machine surface. So now I'm not going to be able to film this because I really can't get the camera back there. But I'm going to do this on the back side. And then once we get these two in, and we'll come back and we'll get this um, kind of close, uh, drill and tap the holes for the M5s here. Let me do that, do that off camera on the back side, and then uh, we'll come back. Well, I got both in. Um, I'm, I don't know how I did this, but I am off a little bit on the placement of my new slotted holes. They should be dead nuts in the middle of these brackets. It's close enough where it's not gonna cause a problem. It's toward the outer third or so of each one but I'm not exactly sure what happened with that, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna scale these in, um, and I'm just actually gonna use this little level right here. This level, believe it or not, is amazingly accurate, this little tiny level. We're gonna use this level and just kinda get it uh, as level as we can right now, just close enough, and then mark the holes, and then we're gonna uh, drill those and tap those. Now once we get that done, I'm gonna clean up a little bit here. I don't wanna be putting my indicator around all this uh, gold dust here. And uh, then we're gonna tram this in, get it trammed in the best as we can. Uh, as far as this goes, I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna do that yet uh, because I guess we can come off the table with my big square. I think that's probably what we'll do, the machine is square. This lip is gonna give us a little trouble so we can put a block in here, like a one, two, three block up against it and then just square it in that way. That'll be close enough. It's not, doesn't have to be perfect, but well, for me it does because I'm OCD and anal retentive, but that's another story entirely. Let's scale her in first and see. We set up the encoder part of it when it gets uh, screwed into this, whatever bracket I make for that. 
that's when we'll make sure that we have the appropriate run. This should be fine. This thing only has like a six inch maximum um, run and that's, it's close. Let's just put it that way. But I think it'll work. I think it'll be okay. So we'll have to make allowances if not, but uh, that means uh, putting it in a spot that we normally run it in. But uh, essentially I think we're gonna be okay with that. Doing one of these things is kind of an exercise in little steps from different angles. So you get part of it done, you line it up, do another part, line that up, and then you kind of go back to the other part, finish line that up, then go to another part, finish line that up, and then by the time you get all your lining up done, you realize that there's a hole in the wrong place and you gotta start over, but that's beside the point. So that looks pretty square to that. I'm gonna set up an indicator now, and we're gonna run the uh, y-axis in and out. We'll just put it on the table here. Well, you can't see where I'm pointing. We're gonna put it on the table here and just run it in that way. We're gonna to have to rely upon the square for, the, for his, it being um, perpendicular to the top of the table here, so square to the table. But we definitely need to have it uh, you know, straight when it goes in and out, and, well, we can do the bottom perhaps the top, when it goes in and out. So these two axes, in other words, this side and this side, have to be zero, or as close to zero as within tolerance. I don't remember what the manual said. There is a tolerance on it. But it certainly has to be within tolerance. Because otherwise, when the encoder's in fix down here or over here, wherever it is, uh, it'll either want to push it together or pull it away, depending on how this thing is angled. So that is the, uh, that is the goal here. So let me get that set up. All right. So there, I didn't do any adjusting or any alignment, so let's see where it's at right now. We're just gonna run it in. Well, that ain't too bad. We're at plus six, seven, eight. Plus 20 thou up to there. That's enough of a run to give us a good, um, a good idea what's going on. So that means that this is 20 thou out. So we want to bump it 10 thou in or take the other one 10 thou out. Um, I'm not really sure which one we're going to do, but um, let me go ahead and get that adjusted and we'll come back. I ended up tapping this side in, but when you do that, then I had to come back and re-square it, which is again what I was talking about before. You move one thing, you got to move another, and you got to go back, blah, 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 blah. Right now we are coming up on about five, four or five on the negative side. That's five. Five to the minus, four or five, actually about four now. Getting closer, probably two or three too much. Never know. Well, I'm almost there. I'm gonna keep working on this and I'll come back when um, I get it as close to dead nuts as I can. I get maybe a thou. That's close enough. That feels good too, as far as squareness to the top of the table. Yep. Now I'm gonna sock these down because to do this, you know, this way, we don't have to mess with these, we mess with these. So that's the beauty of this thing. I have the stair at 196 out for this with that extension kind of to reach in, do a classic reach around with your dial indicator. I'm not too concerned about this, like I said. I just want to make sure it's dialable. We can dial this in. These brackets here are the ones that are the main concern that we already took care of. So we can just loosen this up and start moving this around and just make sure that this is going to dial in. Actually, this is the vertical one. We should be adjusting this one for vertical. You have it upside down. I was completely an idiot here. I had this upside down. See, the screws are supposed to be on top here for where the cover goes down. I don't know what I was thinking. It actually worked out, though, in the end, because 
when you go to put this down to square it up like I did before. Now, with this flipped around, you can actually get that setting. So it works pretty well. The unfortunate part is that these, these holes are not uh, symmetrical on each side. I had to redraw the holes, but this these were already set and they still are right now. As you can see this indicator is, is dead nuts. No problem with this. So this in and out way is fine. I also put the, that stereo, what is it, 196 back in. We'll do that really quick here and I'll show you what I mean. And uh, we'll pick up the uh, underside of this thing and verify that uh, we are still good that way. Um, I, I made some scribe lines before I turned it around, but once I redraw the holes, I could see the scribe lines because like I said, the holes are not symmetrical. So I lined it up to the scribe lines. It was a couple of thou off and that was it. So that's pretty damn good. So it's fine right now. We'll go on the bottom edge here and you can see where we're at. Talk about making a dumbass mistake. I mean, ugh, I try to do these videos to help people out and I just completely screw up. But anyway, now we're indicating on the bottom edge of this thing. So you can see she's, she's pretty good. Then about a thou. Might require a little adjustment, but I'm not gonna make that adjustment now. Yeah, so she's pretty good. Couple of thou, but not too bad. And then I need to put the, uh, the, the scale in. We gotta figure out how we're gonna hook up that encoder down here, but God, I tell you what, I just, I just hate it when I make stupid mistakes. Folks, I had to skip way ahead due to time constraints, so I'm just gonna summarize the rest of this for you. And we're gonna concentrate on the Y-axis one for it because that's the one where you saw the last clips of me drilling and tapping and so forth. Really all you gotta do at that point is you, you just mount the encoder, or the scale rather, onto that backing plate using the two screws, there's one on each end. They have some flexibility or movement up and down because you need to re-indicate the scale itself. You can't just go off of the, uh, off of the backing plate. It's just good practice to indicate that in. You really don't need to. I mean, you could get it really close and then just indicate the scale, but I like to indicate the backing plate. Um, this is the second one I've done on this um, DRO install, and then punch that up against that lip, now that this is in the proper orientation, instead of being up, upside down, and then uh, it comes in real close. And then all you gotta do is make finite adjustments. So you run this across with an indicator on the scale, make sure that it's nice and true, and then you're in a position where you can mount your encoder down in here. And then uh, really all you gotta do for that is pick the middle spot of your travel to make sure you don't bottom it out where it deadheads on one end or the other. Uh, in this case, you're supposed to have 10 mil of clearance before it hits the end of the scale you know, on either side. Really all you gotta do is kind of guesstimate that and uh, figure out the center of your travel. And as long as you've uh, bought the right scale, it's gonna automatically fall into place. How I did this one, as you can see, is it's just another angle bracket that was machined and also drilled with the slots um, so I could have some adjustability. The adjustability is not only this way, but the adjustability is straight up. And I don't have to worry about on, on the backside to get it this way because I bent the bracket to conform to the little bit of a taper on the base here. So once I got that set, and you do have a little flexibility because this, this encoder kind of spring mounted in there. Uh, once I got that set, we could just run this up using that red piece I talked to you about before, which is also for shipping and a spacer. Get the proper spacing. I, I happen to use uh, four screws on the bottom of this one. I only used two on this one because I only had two left. That's fine, I've staggered them. You can see I basically did the same thing on the um, x-axis as I did on the y-axis. So once you get that done and you get the fixed part of your, where your encoder's gonna go, then you get all that, make sure that that's good, test it, get your cable management started, put your covers on, and Bob's your uncle. Then all you gotta do is uh, mount your display. So like I said, I'm sorry I had to kinda scoot forward on this, but I, I had to get this done because um, I need the mill and uh, I, I just needed to get it done and move on to other things. But came out real well. As you can see the detail of the uh, mounting of that on the, uh, the encoder and so forth and the scale for the x-axis. I did use the slots I mentioned before earlier in the video. 
you can see it's kind of like a dovetail. It isn't really a T-nut that goes in there. It's more like a, just an angled piece of steel that's got two holes in it. In this case, they're quarter 20s. And uh, these holes in the backing plate are designed really up to M6. So quarter inch and M6 are very close. So I just filed them out a little bit. Didn't have to do anything with the counter bores. They went right in. So I've got one screw about there and one screw about there. And you can adjust them a little bit the same way you get the backing plate leveled in first with a dial indicator and then put the encoder in and do the same thing I explained for the y-axis down here. Now this was a little bit of a challenge because I needed to make sure that when the cover was on that this is actually below the surface of the table for reasons like this. Or if I have a part that's overhanging it like a cylinder block or a cylinder head or something I'm doing something on. We certainly can't have something raising the part up, nor can we have something crushing this down. I kind of guessed at that, and then when I put the cover on, I was like, uh-oh. So I used a depth mic, and it's like about six thou below over here and three thou below over there, because, you know, I had to level it. And I indicated in, rather, but it's below, so that's all I care about. You know, your mileage may differ, but if you're going to put one of these on in a mill like this, uh, you may want to drop it down a little bit further, drill into the table instead of using those T those slots rather, but it worked out pretty well. You know, you could also modify the backing plate, extend those um, counterbore slots and the slots for the fastener to drop the whole thing down. Um, if I needed to do that, I would have, but like I said, didn't need to do it. It is technically, not technically, it's, it's actually below the surface based on the measurements. So yeah, I'm happy with it the way it came out and everything works just fine, which I'll show you right here. Is turn it on, and all my cables managed. And so, we'll go ahead and zero out both axes. We're not using Z on this one, we're using it on this. And as you can see, if we dial in the X-axis, she's just perfect. Apologize for the brevity toward the end there. I went through some pretty good detail during the video and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what happened? Well, like I said, I had to move on. So the last part of it was really just kind of a summary, but up to that point, you pretty much got what you need to know presented to you on this particular application. And this would extrapolate out to just about any application, it really would. You wanna make sure that your backing plate is as straight up and down or whatever surface you're mounting it on. It's got to be parallel with it or perpendicular to another reference surface, something like that, kind of like I did with the Y-axis one over there from the table down to it um, as possible because that's going to save you time and it's going to save strain and wear on the encoder and so forth if that is mounted a little bit less or more accurate, I should say, than the scale is or vice versa. There is a little flexibility in there. When you take these things out of the package, kind of wants to spring up the encoder versus on or relative to the scale. And that's because it is like a springy mounted in there. I do try to keep it as straight as possible, two of them parallel, because again, um, accuracy matters, all right? And the other thing is, just take your time, um, clean as you go. You want to keep it, your area as uh, clean as possible because you're working around you know these delicate glass uh, scales, which are not the most rugged in my my understanding at least not experience but my understanding is the most rugged uh, for this particular application um, the magnetic ones are supposedly better but they're wicked more expensive too so then once you get all that done you just basically hook it all up run your cables it's really not that difficult to do i hope this video has given you some confidence and some ideas and a good baseline in which to uh, move from if you wanted to go this route on a mill of this size in particular. All right, so that with that, I guess it's about time to shut down and we're gonna move on to the next project. Uh, as I said before, I hope you got something out of this. If you did, consider sticking around by subscribing, liking, sharing, ringing the bell. Get notified when I put more crap like this up, other motorcycle stuff, midweek machining videos, things like that. So I guess until next time, as always, thanks for watching. Don't just repair, restore. We'll catch you on the next video.